to tell you a story, a story of how a commitment to sustainability is made in the real world of corporate America. Think of it like a schoolhouse rock piece, but without the catchy song. First, a little background. I've been with Bon Appetit Management Company for 18 years. The company was founded in 1987 by Fidel Bauchio, who's still our CEO. Back then, food service ran on canned vegetables and mystery meat. Fidel changed that by hiring professional chefs to cook restaurant quality food from scratch. That's him there on the right with one of our chefs. These days, we serve over 140 million meals a year to some pretty well-known corporations, colleges, and museums. I've worked on creating a number of purchasing policies aimed at creating food service for a sustainable future. In 1999, we created our Farm to Fork program, committing to buying at least 20% of our ingredients from small, owner-operated farms and artisans within 150 miles of our kitchens. We've tackled tough issues like antibiotics in meat production, sustainable seafood, climate change, and farm workers' rights. Along the way, I've learned a fair amount about how our food system works, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm going to take you behind the scenes, tell you what really goes on when a well-meaning, socially responsible company tries to make change. A lot of people think that when a corporation the size of Bon Appetit wants to buy more humanely raised meat, all we have to do is write a bigger check to a different supplier. Ever since 2005, when we committed to buying only cage-free, certified, humane shell eggs, I've been trying to source more humane meat in general. I work with producers around the country and with the Humane Society of the United States, and Fidel goes out and makes noise about how animals are raised in this country. My boss has never been a very soft-spoken guy who keeps his opinions to himself. He spent two years on the Pew Commission for Industrial Farm Animal Production, and it left an indelible mark on him. He'd looked out onto a lake of manure and then seen it sprayed on the fields. He sat in the living rooms of families who couldn't let their children play outside because the stench of the nearby factory hog farms was giving them respiratory problems. Communities with higher incident rates of asthma and cancer. These experiences changed him. So whenever asked, and sometimes before he's asked, Fidel rails against factory farming in general, and he names names. He calls out specific suppliers whose operations he's visited. As you can imagine, they aren't too happy about that. Next thing I know, the chief sustainability officer of America's largest pork producer is flying to our Palo Alto headquarters to ask why Fidel's been bad-mouthing them. Well, Fidel told him all right, and I watch. I thought about bringing popcorn, but that did seem inappropriate. I do have to say, it was brave of this corporate executive to come meet us, his critics, on our turf and open the lines of communication. The problem is, the chasm between us seems about as wide as one of his factory's manure lagoons. But Fidel's willing to wade in. He says, set up a little farm, that raises hogs the way we want them, and I'll buy everything you can produce. I know we'll have to pay more, but that's OK. No non-therapeutic antibiotics, no inhumane practices like tail docking or gestation crates, no manure lagoons. We'll buy it, and I know others will too. Sounds great, right? It gets complicated. I thought I knew about the industrial food system. But this conversation begins my true education. Hurdle number one, how do you define sustainable hog production? We need a credible third party standard. I suggest food alliances. It's the only standard that covers both animal welfare as well as environmental impacts, both huge issues in pork production. Hurdle number two, what do you do with the rest of the pig? Turns out Bon Appetit chefs use a lot of bacon, a fair amount of ham, but not that many chops or shoulders. We'll never buy enough baby back ribs to go through all the bacon we need. So 
we'll need a partner. Oops, that brings us back to hurdle number one, standards. Other food companies have developed their own standards, some internal, some alongside animal welfare agencies. Great guidelines for the treatment of animals, but nothing about environmental impacts. So are we gonna ask the producer to follow two sets of standards, have two inspections, fill out two sets of paperwork? That doesn't really seem reasonable. I hatch a plan to see if I can at least get Food Alliance and Global Animal Partnership, which Whole Foods requires, to harmonize their standards. Well, again, an education. <laughs> Several conference calls later, both organizations are excited about the possibility of making changes to a major producer's processes. Both organizations are complementary of each other's work. Both are also not offering to change their standards. They've been through rounds and rounds of expert advice and public comment. They can't easily just change. We do come up with a compromise, though. Auditors can be trained to do both inspections simultaneously. To the rancher, it will feel like one audit, but the auditor will then fill out separate forms and send them to the respective certifying agencies. Not ideal, but workable. So that brings us back to hurdle number two. If we have a producer raise pigs for us in a certain way, how do we use up all that pork? Meet the pig puzzle. I knew bacon came from the belly, but I didn't know that a typical 250-pound hog yields just eight pounds of bacon. That you can get twice as much ham as you can center cut pork chops, but if you want tenderloin, you can not also have that pork chop. Well, I learn. And I learn about the economics of production. All of a sudden, I'm thinking about the number of sows on a farm and piglet mortality rates. About how in order to make sure we get our special humanely raised pork, it has to be segregated through the entire supply chain. That means that our hogs have to go to the slaughterhouse separately. Now we're talking slaughter line rates and processing facility capacity. It gets to be a lot of pigs really quickly and we haven't yet found the right partners to buy up the rest of those pigs. Even with our seven and a half million dollars of annual pork purchases, even with Fidel offering to pay more per pound, we can't guarantee enough volume to make that imaginary utopian farm work. I haven't given up, but decided to weigh other options. What if we took on the most egregious practices first? Maybe I can't solve all the problems, but can we at least get the sows out of the gestation crates? In the pork industry, most breeding sows are confined to cages roughly the same size as they are, 24-7 for their entire four-month pregnancy. It's supposedly to keep them from fighting, but they can't even turn around. They're then taken out of the gestation crates, put into farrowing crates to give birth, re-impregnated, and put back into the gestation crates. That cycle continues for their entire lives, up to four years. It's horrible. I draw a line in the mud. Within five years, by 2017, note the date, we'll phase out all pork from animals raised using gestation crates. We'll be the first food service company to take a stand on hog production. <laughs> Not so fast. <laughs> we'll publicly call out this inhumane practice and we'll shame the producers into making change. I proudly walk this proposal into Fidel's office and get my head torn off. 25%? Five years? What? I want to do it now. And that's the sanitized version of what he said. <laughs> Fidel wants to go farther and faster, and in my heart, I do too, but I keep thinking of all those hurdles. So after a very heated debate, Fidel takes a deep breath, and I take a leap. Last February, almost exactly one year ago today, we announced that we're giving our suppliers just three years only until 2015 to get rid of gestation crates, or we'll be looking for other suppliers. Now, this public commitment means that we're promising to buy something that doesn't yet exist. It was a calculated risk. 
And we promised a few other things, too. This one was easy. Told the few chefs that were buying it to knock it off. I'd love to go into the details of all of these, but that would take me about another hour. And to make things even more complicated, Food Alliance, which I mentioned earlier, has just announced that we're ceasing operations. So best that we just stick with the gestation crate story for now. We've got a policy. Yay. OK. <laughs> now the real work begins. How do I live up to that big, audacious goal by 2015? I thought I got lucky. In the months since we made our announcement, over 30 other restaurant companies, food processors, and supermarkets have followed suit. Of course, since they don't have the same aggressive CEO that I do, their timelines are a bit longer than ours. Gestation crates are on their way out. Problem solved. Yes and no. Buyers like us are making promises faster than producers are changing their practices. Now all these companies want that imaginary crate-free pork. We're competing with McDonald's and Oscar Mayer. So hurdle number one is standards, two is that pig puzzle, and three is the number of corporations that want to bring home that bacon. At the end of this story, we're willing to write the bigger check. We're still struggling to implement our policy, and the pigs are not yet wallowing in the mud. Will I meet the aggressive deadline? Will I bankrupt the company with higher food costs? Ask me in December of 2014 <laughs> if I still have a job. <laughs> I do believe we can all dine on more humane sausage. Making it just isn't a very pretty process.